Hello, I'm Alan McGuire, and this is Juvenalia, a podcast about challenge things. My co-host today is Sarah Marie Griffin. Hello. Hi. How are you? And our guest is Dara McCausland. Hello. Hello. Hi. Dara is um, a writer whose work has been in Gorse and Dublin Review and Stonecutter. So what are you going to talk to us about today? I'm going to talk about a computer game, um, a PC. Uh, well, originally on the PC called Wolfenstein 3D, and it's a it's a probably one of the early pr- prototypes of not the first, but there's another one I want to talk about as well. But we'll get to that. Um, an early prototype of a, the first person shooter type kind of popular game, it? FPS. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it came out in 1992. But when did you play it first? Do you reckon? Probably in 1993, I would yeah. say. Um, I, uh, I I was 12 years old in 1993, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, so I would have. Uh, it was a, a shareware game, mm-hmm. which is I think is one of the fascinating things about it because, um, uh, well, to explain what share, shareware is, because we're we're talking about the depths of time <laughs> here. Mm-hmm. Um, the, it, PC games, uh, you could either buy the kind of commercial big games made by the big companies, mm-hmm. but there are a lot of sort of um, indie developers um, that were making these games that you could order from the back of games catalogs for free called shareware. So you would try try it out. And they were very generous. Often you would get the whole game, and mm. if you liked it, then you would send send them a certain amount of money by post and get extra levels yeah. or stuff. Um, and Wolfenstein came from, uh, I think they were first they were called Apogee, and then they were called ID. Mm. Um, just a bunch, just a bunch of kind of programmer guys operating on their own kind of kind of cool idea, really. Um. Does you probably had a home computer, but then did you play it, or was it in your friend's house? Yeah, or? Um, yeah we. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably a character, a secondary character in this. This whole <laughs> story is going to be my identical twin brother. Uh, we operated kind of as a unit back mm-hmm. then, um, uh, as identical twins do when they're about twelve years old. They they sort of separate out, out a little bit then into their mm. into their later teens. But um, yeah, we we. Um, we were obsessed with the consoles, with the Sega Mega Drive and the Super mm. Nintendo, and a couple of kids had got them. But we we had a, if, it's in retrospect, we had a really cool console. Yeah. But at the time, we didn't think it was cool. It was the Atari seventy eight hundred, right. and nobody nobody else had it. Yeah, it was kind of Atari's um, take on the the eight bit console, which would have been the. The, the two main ones were the Nintendo Entertainment System and the Sega Master System. So Atari brought this out, but but it was delayed. It came out too late, so it kind of mm. flopped. Um, so they were selling them for cheap in Nav and Shopping Center. <laughs> they had about three of them. And our parents, we really wanted a, a, a Nintendo, but they got us the Atari 7800. Now, in saying that, we, we ended up loving it. And, and our dad, who... who who still can't send a text off a mobile phone got addicted to the game that was um, inside the, the it was actually inside the console and you plug it into the telly mm. the game comes on and the game was called Asteroids so he would sit in the know, sitting yeah, room yeah, when yeah. he wasn't at work yeah. with the curtains pulled playing Asteroids <laughs> and we had to bully him off off the co- console um, to play it so so we had the Atari 7800 and um, then we had extreme envy for the the Mega Drive and the Super Nintendo for a while, um, but then we 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 were getting like in Navin Market actually they were selling um, old computer games magazines that were a month old in bundles for fifty p yes. um, yes. with the covers ripped off them because the the news agents had to send the covers back to get a refund. So yep. so we would get all these PC magazines that were a month or two old. Um, and one of them was called PC Zone, and actually a journalist that's kind of known for other things today, Charlie Brooker. He was oh. mm. he was writing in PC Zone, and I would say it was his best work. <laughs> <laughs> but he's he's gone downhill gradually <laughs> ever since, um, uh, and especially to teenage boys, his his jur- like it was kind of event writing for us. We mm-hmm. used to we used to just gobble it up, and we got kind of romantically attached to the idea of getting a PC. So our parents drove up to northern ireland to get one for cheaper and we got one um in in some town in armagh a a, a 386 processor which was if you think okay we're talking about gigahertz today Mm. it was 20 megahertz (laughs) was the was the processor Mm. so that was that was um where it all began and after that we got like extremely into pc gaming for Mm. the next probably five years i would say because those discs that came with like pc zone all those kind of things were amazing 
They were, yeah. Just there the were such a bag of, of treats. Yeah. yeah. So, so you, you, uh, Alan, have experience in this? <laughs> yeah, I was probably nine when we got our first PC, but it was Windows oh, right, 95, okay. so it was a couple of years later. Yeah. yeah. But and we had one as well. It yeah. was really, it was really powerful. I was I, a big SNES kid all the way. Oh, up, but brilliant. The PC kind of, my dad discovered how to download emulators of a oh, Game Boy, so yeah. which means you don't have to buy the kid a Game Boy. Yeah. Uh, so I was, yeah, I was in that wagon yeah, too. Yeah. 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 Great. But actually, the first place I played Wolfenstein was on our school computer because we finally got a, a computer in each classroom in like fifth class so when I was like 10 but all that was on the computer was Solitaire, Wolfenstein and Encarta <laughs> so if you're finished work you have to go use the computer yeah, Encarta had like yeah. a maze level didn't it Encarta had like a it had a um, that quiz game thing yeah, yeah with the gesture yeah it's, that's but such that's a motley crew Wolfenstein. of games yeah. but that's so <laughs> typical of the PC you have so yeah. you have so much variety and weirdness mm. that you wouldn't get with a console like, I don't know yeah. how it ended up on a school PC in the first place mm. but it was there and I think it, it was, was like in a kit or something some yeah. Yeah. or maybe some rogue smuggler yeah. <laughs> <laughs> rogue sub teacher yeah yeah which d- I've actually boned up on some Wolfenstein uh, trivia, and and um, there are there are there is a story, a narrative about rogue Wolfenstein smuggling. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, um, in Germany. <laughs> oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> because yeah, yeah. Um, cultural depictions of of um, Nazi Germany or the swastika, mm. and Wolfenstein <laughs> is like there's like a hundred swastikas <laughs> like in the opening scene. Like there's every- whole levels designed as swastikas. Yeah, 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 because you're escaping from a Nazi keep and. Um, so all the walls are adorned with pictures of the Führer and swastikas, and um, so that made it illegal in mm. Germany. So um, German gamers were really keen to get this game because everyone was talking about it yeah. because it was so, um, in terms of of its 3D graphics, it was you know it was the game to get, mm. and. Um, they so they in the back of German games magazines they changed the name of it to this code name, <laughs> uh, and they had a picture of a false game, so you had to be in the know yeah. to, as to what the game was, and you could order it that way and and get a, a kind of an illegal copy of it. Yeah, that's amazing. Then they re then they reprogrammed the game for an official once it once it grew from its original shareware mm. um, into a kind of a bigger commercial beast. They they reprogrammed the game so that. The images were were removed in the German version, but when it came out in Super Nintendo, they removed the yeah. swastikas as well. So what's left? It's just walls. No, no, <laughs> they replaced them with, with benign symbols, <laughs> or or maybe vague, no, vaguely, vaguely um, Nazi-ish symbols like, like uh, and crosses and yeah, things. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, and that was its first problem. But then it ran into trouble with the the actual the Red Cross humanitarian organization <laughs> because there were. Um, Red crosses on the health packs that you oh, yeah. yeah that you power up from um and improve your health and the Red Cross went on this sort of mad crusade against all the games that were using the symbol so they replaced mm. it with hearts in in a in a later version but I think I think the Red Cross kind of failed because I think a lot of games since have it's kind of the the symbol yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 even still it's weird mm. and. I know there's some like in Germany is it that all blood has to be green in games and in oh. Australia it's black I think all blood has to be black okay. or is it the other way around one of those yeah <laughs> I think they've loosened that now but That's until very recently in Germany blood in games has to be green yeah I feel like play. I remember playing um, Street Fighter or something from that that sort of beat him up like button basher mm. I am six and I do not know what this is uh, time and noting that the blood was green mm. and even back even back mm. then being like Come on now. <laughs> it is Streets of Rage, it's green as well. Mortal Kombat, I think. Mortal Kombat. Mor- that is it. Yeah. Mortal Kombat. That was the one. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I was just like, yeah, but I know what this really it's is. It's weird in respect that like computer games are like can do anything and you can go anywhere in the world, but you still have like, this option to turn blood on or off. Like, that's the important thing you need to be able to control for yourself. It's like, do you want blood or not? With the presence yeah. of violence. Yeah. Like so me. people yeah. faint at the sight of blood. Mm, that's, that's true. true. But also, like the, the you know the the storytelling method of con- the, of the video game by and large, like how you move the plot forward. I was I, this is what I was talking about yesterday, and the I wrote an essay about this recently. And uh, how you move that story forward is by violence. Like mm-hmm. it is exactly how you tell a story. Mm. You kill the thing, you move forward. You kill the thing, you move forward. You kill the thing in a different way, you move forward. And like that's and I feel like pretending that that's not what you're doing by changing the color of the blood it's like mm. own yourself come on you know go big or go home but that's all that's all censorship board stuff while well, the censorship board don't actually look into the yeah the, the deeper implications of telling stories through violence yeah, kind of structural things i mean yeah. like i've been murdering that's, baddies since i was a six-year-old when mm. i'm grand but like i don't think it actually does impact people that way i but i do think that i think it's a bit of a 
it's like, okay, we've done it. Our job is done here. <laughs> All the blood is green, you know? I don't know about it. So you and your brother got, did you, you got Wolfenstein and was it like an instant like obsession or was it like? Yeah. It? Um, so I said it was the, it was an early type of a first person shooter. Mm. We got a, another game before that I kind of want to talk about. Yeah, go well. yeah. yeah. It was called the Catacomb Abyss and okay. it was made by the same developers. Um, the main difference, it's, this was sort of the prototype for Wolfenstein, but the main difference between it were th- the graphics. So Catacomb Abyss had a limited, more limited pal- palette mm-hmm. called EGA, mm-hmm. which only had 16 colors. And wow. Wolfenstein was VGA, which had 256 colors. So it was a real sort of step up. Yeah. But um, Wolfenstein as well moved really fast. But the Catacomb Abyss had this really grungy, cool vibe. And I, I went back to that as well, actually, mm-hmm. a few days ago um, when I was kind of looking at stuff about Wolfenstein. Um, and it, like Wolfenstein, because I, I, I went back to Doom as well, um, the, the game that was subsequent to Wolfenstein. And it, the earlier ones, I kind of prefer. They seem to hold up better. Mm. Um, there's, or maybe it's just something to do with my own imagination and my own attachment to them. But, but the Catacomb of this is so cool. Um, it's like it moves a bit slower than Wolfenstein, but uh, you, you're in, you see you're escaping from these catacombs that are controlled by an evil wizard. But um, it gives these little kind of gnomic uh, descriptions of the areas you're in that are yeah. really like, and they, they've all re- remained in my mind. And I, I, I actually even learned a new word from it, guano. Uh, so it was like one, you're escaping from this cave and it says beneath knee deep in guano. <laughs> and I, I, didn't look, I didn't look it up for a while. And I, I, the word was this kind of mystery word in my yeah. mind. Then I found out it's, it's batshit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I learned that, what that meant from Ace Ventura too. Oh, that's right. That's a, that's a okay. big, big, guano was a big plot point in Ace 90s Ventura 90s learning too. words. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so that had this sort of cool, grungy fantasy vibe to it. But then um, Wolfenstein really blew everyone's minds because the programmers worked out this way to make um, a game similar to the Catacomb Abyss, but to look like ex- a sort of a, kind of a quantum or paradigm leap more sophisticated mm. and really fast. That was the, the, the really impressive thing about it was that the 3D was so smooth. And to us, it, it was sort of it was sort of like taking LSD or something <laughs> like like it was completely amazing because our computer w- wasn't quite it's sort of like you know the when we got it sort of the second wine up from the bottom on the menu you yeah, know yeah. it was just functional um good it could play a lot of games but it couldn't play the fanciest games but mm-hmm. there were games that were less impressive and less fast than wolfenstein that there was no chance they could have worked on our computer like mm-hmm. flight simulator games but wolfenstein yeah. looked like 10 times better and it ran perfectly and this was the real draw of it well mm-hmm. there was you know there's other other things too like blowing up nazis and stuff when you're a <laughs> yeah. teenage boy but or teenage any gender mm. but um uh yeah so that was that was kind of um the the thing about it was was the graphics and the, the sense of moving around these 3d spaces you know the kind of the geography of the game was kind of mind-blowing mm. you know um and, and it was like the whole the whole thing about it like it was very very well um kind of like you think of perfect examples of a genre like the perfect platformer is, is Mario or, or Mega Man and everything seemed to be in the right place like the guards were in the right place yeah the, the, the there was variation in the levels that you know like you would always be surprised even though there, it was so limited what they were working with like three levels in suddenly the walls become wood they were deep <laughs> before that they were bricks yeah. and we're like whoa wood you know like yeah. that kind of thing and yeah it was it, there's just something something really cool about that game mm. yeah yeah and did like did you i don't share where so did you just have those first 10 levels or did you ever expand out um one? yeah but <laughs> i don't i don't recall us i don't think we paid for them i think either a friend of ours got them and lent them to us or there was a man who we used to call he was like <laughs> we grew up in kells so he's the computer fixer guy in kells he was mm. like the first person to know about pcs apparently so he had this reputation uh, he's since run as a fine gale town, town <laughs> councillor <laughs> that's his, his future but before he became a fine gale town councillor he used to go from house to house and he'd sit he'd sit at your pc smoking loads of fags and then and then he, 
he'd he'd fix it but as well he'd give you like like loads of stuff like yeah. games and all <laughs> so i think uh i think he he could well have been the source of <laughs> of mm. all the levels yeah but we got the yeah we got the full game there's six episodes and each has about i think about 10 10 levels in yeah. it or so yeah what you're saying about the lag was really interesting and the idea that it moved fast was part of the appeal that there was no waiting around and that there were games that were less less good that computers back then just refused to play yeah and uh i had i feel like that's my primary memory of pc gaming growing up because i did do a fair bit of it was the reason that i preferred the emulators which yeah. looked terrible and were largely translated so poorly that they were <laughs> yeah. almost almost incomprehensible yeah like my first pop my first pokemon game was like pocket monsters yeah. translated from japanese on my like computer yeah uh, it was a I have no. I I learning all the Pokemon's names for the first time. Like when the TV show came out a couple mm. of years later, I was like, "Well, this is this is new. I didn't know what any <laughs> of these guys were called." Um, but real a real primary memory for me is speed. I mean, I we had Mist on my on my computer, and I yeah. I, I God, I did the best with Mist that I could for a kid. Uh, I loved it atmospherically, but the computer just resisted it. And I think that speed thing is really fascinating because we sat down uh, a little while ago to watch um, to watch Wolfenstein, which yeah. I got access to it, and we watched a speed run of it. Yeah, well, cool. we watched about two minutes of a speed run of it yeah. before I was like, this is going so fast that I'm going to get <laughs> You're sick. You're going to get, yeah. I'm getting car, I'm getting car sick. Third person, first person shooters are really interesting in what they do to, like in terms of putting you in the body of the of the protagonist and, br- and like breaking the fourth wall or inviting a breaking mm. of the fourth wall but for me I always find them almost sickening that mm. there's this it's a, it's it's this slight wrongness and yeah. trying to watch the speedrun of it was like oh I ca- oh my goodness it is like LSD I can't yeah. I have to go outside for a minute it was a bit uh, yeah that's it was interesting rock and roll. Um, because when you read the piece well when we used to read the PC game magazines back then they would give the specs of the the, the minimum specs mm. that could run the game in the, in the bottom of the review, yeah. and we would be making this sort of kind of balance up in our mind, thinking will will our computer or won't yeah. it? So mm. so would say it needs tw- so the magic number for a while was twenty five megahertz. <laughs> I keep laughing now yeah. when I think of gigahertz, mm. but the, yeah, the magic number was twenty five megahertz, and. Um, it, this game that we we subsequently became even more obsessed with than Wolfenstein, um, an adventure game called Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. Mm. Uh, it's that said it needed twenty five megahertz, but we we gambled on it, and um, because you could do this thing, you see when. Um, the, the game magazines used to show you how you could actually go into files and the, the important file was this file called autoexecbat.bat mm, yeah, yeah. and you would go inside it so and you would sort of reprogram the files so you could trick your computer into thinking it had less operations to run um, and it would make it run a game a little bit more competently than than it would otherwise. Early um, so, hacking, yeah, yeah. Early, kind of early hacking. Yeah, it was. Um, this makes it sound like I know a jot about computer programming. It all, <laughs> it all fell out the window when I when I got into music and stuff, and mm. and uh, you know I I completely um, have no no skill or knowledge in that area. It's all a mystery to me. But I did did actually do that for a while. Learned how to go into into that file and. And adjust it, but then the thing, like you were saying, Sir Marie, is about, about the speed. You would actually, if if the game was worth it, you would suffer through the lag and you the would slow. Just wait. You just sit <laughs> yeah, there yeah. while your computer <laughs> made it. those horrific noises. It would grind, you know? and <laughs> like it was a real. And, you're, and it, so, it would sound <sighs> literally like your computer was a human dying, leaving <laughs> in front of you, just trying to load the next screen. Yeah. And like especially for me with Mist, it was just so obtuse and difficult. And if you solved a puzzle. You're sitting there feeling like a champion, an 11 year old genius yeah. because you managed to put this dot in the right place and then it just wouldn't load the next screen. Yeah. And you're kind of bargaining with this mm. old machine going, please, please, please. I'm so clever. Please reward me <laughs> for my cleverness. Yeah. And it just it was such a different time. And I feel that's where console gaming stepped stepped up and stepped in in this effortlessness yeah. where you could yeah. just put that cartridge in that thing. Maybe. If you hadn't played it in a minute, you might have to blow into it. Yeah. But by and large, you could just put it in the machine and a coin would ping on the screen and you could just go. Yeah. And uh, that shortcut. Sort of the idea of a kind of a universality and, mm. and you don't need to worry about, um, yeah, you don't need to, to, to worry about all the little tricky, tricky 
PC gaming, and it still is. It's it's kind of complicated and a bit arcane, really. And it's Which always is a had shame, that, that because yeah, it's the, always there, had that reputation. There are games there that are so accessible and amazing stories to be told and yeah. experienced, but yeah. through this sort of even Steam, I find it very unfriendly. You know, even if it, visually, it's just like yeah, hey, look at this mad list and of I, games. I yeah. play Steam, and it kind of creeps me out as well. The yeah. Same way that iTunes does, because I feel that Steam is a kind of like to explain Steam maybe for people that are listening to the podcast. It's the PC interface now for playing games so to, to play a game on the pc now you need to download this program steam and it's a bit like itunes and yeah and it's like goth the, itunes they're kind yeah. of feeding sort of feeling into your computer and finding out you know you need to be online a lot of the time for some of the games you need to sign up with credit card details so you're kind of giving away bits of you know mm. of stuff that you didn't have to do in the past and and it's yeah it's kind of you feel less you feel less autonomous and you feel like you've got less agency that maybe you don't quite own the games that Steam yeah. owns them or something. Like, like dipping into a library. Yeah. But what yeah. it also does is it almost acts as a console interface so it checks it does the is this 25 megahertz? Like it checks your system and permits yeah, you to play the games yeah. that you can play. Yeah, like, but the whole process of going through it is so it's 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 a uh, it's no crack yeah. and it almost ru- not that it ruins the experience because I've played some terrific games through mm. Steam in the last year and, and fun ones and serious ones of, of all different yeah. kinds but loading up that info I'm just oh it's so hostile yeah. <laughs> it's just like can I live give me a little white box that I can stick a quick cartridge into on yeah. any day and do you still play play emulators no, not so much anymore because I have because I'm a grown lady who can buy games. It's yeah. so exciting. <laughs> well, I would say that probably ninety percent. Like I, I play games when I can, and in mm. my mind, I play games a lot. A lot, but my um, fiance has a no. You hardly ever play them. You just talk about them and think, think about, about them, them. <laughs> and they're or, watch, the, or watch someone else play them on YouTube. And yeah. that's something else I actually want to w- talk about: the satisfaction of, of, watching, of watching other people yeah, play video games. games. Because it really is a thing. When I was a teenager, my worst nightmare, and I tell you, I spent enough years, I've done my time watching boys play video games where you just cannot get a handle on the controller Mm. because they do not want to hear all you have to say or think and they don't believe that you can understand it and la da 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 gentle teenage sexism. But now I actually watch dudes play video games for a hobby, which I really have a very hard time reconciling with. <laughs> where I'll sit down and I'll watch these these channels full of guys. If I'm writing or if I'm working, I'll just throw up a game that I love from the past on YouTube and I'll leave two benign commentators playing through it in the background because it's very calming. I don't mm. know what it is about it. There's yeah. something lovely about it yeah. in the background. And so there's two camps. So you're in the commentator camp because I like to watch the, the kind of silent ones. Sometimes I watch yeah. the silent ones for the jams, like um, for the music. So they, 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 you can say play through no voiceover in YouTube mm. or you can watch it on Twitch and stuff. But um, I I went through a phase last year of um, because I was watching this thing on YouTube. It was... Um, this guy it's amazing it's actually probably the greatest thing that was ever done on youtube and i hope i hope that the guy who's doing it gets recognized in future social histories for the importance of what he's doing or or cultural history he's he's an american man who's playing through literally every single nintendo game um that was ever made and giving a history of it and it's called crontendo so he's going through them all in chronological chronological order um and he he talks he talks through them, but I would find the games that he talks through and and I find interesting. I would get these silent playthroughs. Yeah. So I was going into this kind of Buddhist trance, yeah. just sitting with my laptop, watching this game from the nineteen eighties silently, or not well without a human voice, but mm. the music and the and the you know the the sound effects, just just playing through um, and kind of getting it and then you can kind of because you're not playing it yourself you you, you get absorbed into aspects of the game world um, and you realise a lot of the little shoot 'em ups and stuff the graphics and them the, the Japanese being a culture of kind of continual refinement on mm. on a theme the, the difference between Japanese role playing games and western role playing games tends to be western role playing games always try to reinvent the wheel with each new game and do something amazing and new but the Japanese love to refine something that's uh, already been you know a success now there's a bit of Final Fantasy 13 part yeah. 2 <laughs> <laughs> now there's a bit of change that like because because the, I suppose capitalist markets and everything have started to cause a lot more experiment experimenting in a kind of a western way in the Japanese role playing games but there's still a great audience in Japan for 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 basic models of games that have hardly altered apart from refinements of mm. of of the original um 
uh, until it becomes something quite beautiful and perfect. Um, and so, so I'd be watching these shoot 'em up games on the Nintendo and looking at the artwork and mm. the and the backgrounds and thinking, whoa, this is this is real. It's not just like you're not just watching it for the music and the, and the action. You're you're getting a kind of an aesthetic um, yeah, experience. Yeah, uh, yeah, joy out of, out of out of the way it looks. Um, and yeah, it's 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 great. It's a good it's a good hobby. It is actually it's a good a harmless good hobby. I, mean, I feel like I never speak about yeah. it out loud because yeah. I do it so constantly. But I feel like it's the kind of thing where if I was sitting down at brunch with the girls and be like, guys. <laughs> you want to see the speeder yeah. I just watch they just be like you, you yeah, job yeah. Um, but honestly they uh, it, is an, it is you do see things that you don't get the chance to see as a child when you're watching mm. them because when you're a child watching them I personally playing the Super Nintendo growing up I had two people who I would recruit to beat level bosses for me because they made me so <laughs> anxious so it gives you sort of an insight to the kind of kid I was that I couldn't handle the Donkey Kong Country 3 boss because it looked too much like a real wasp like but um <laughs> You're so when you're a child. We, we were speaking a little bit before we turned on the 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 podcast about you have a different capacity for engaging with a different world. Your imagination is broader. Yeah. You're, you li- you have you're you're, you're more <laughs> open to living in other worlds. Mm. So when you're playing games as a kid, you are fully playing those games, and you are eyes your eyes are on the prize. You're less really exploring in many of them and looking yeah. at the world than you are doing <coughs> your thing. Whereas now in playthroughs, I can. You can see details and things like that mm. that you never would have seen when you were a kid playing them because you were too busy hyperventilating and trying to shoot the target. Yeah. Or yeah. I was too busy <laughs> hyperventilating, you know? So, yeah. It's like it opened up so many games to me that I never would have known about because not a lot of things came out here, you know? It's true. Like, yeah. our, the European market is so much more specific than even the Americans. Yeah, definitely. Um, but it, it kind of brings me to this idea when you're talking about Steam, there's a kind of a counter counter site to Steam that's doing very well now mm-hmm. called GOG Good Old Games yeah. okay um, th- there was like never first there was a sort of a, like when people were talking about retro gaming and it's this sort of you know it's a big hobby now and people buy all the old cartridges and everything and there's podcasts about it um, PC retro gaming was never quite as big a deal as um, for whatever reason and I think it's probably something to do with the the collecting aspect of collecting cartridges and stuff was never quite Mm. as big as console retro gaming but all of a sudden about a year ago PC retro gaming has completely exploded but before a year ago you could get all the PC games from the 90s and 80s on these sites and you can still get some of them but there's but now that retro gaming, PC gaming has become more commercial, there's sort of um, legal takedowns and mm. stuff. But there are these sites called Ab- Abandonware. And one, the best one was called Ab- Abandonia. And you could go on the site and you could literally find every every single PC game that you ever remembered, but ones like them that you didn't remember. And there would be literally 2,000 of these games. And then you would download this interface called DOSBox. So DOS was the old from from my, yeah, yeah my dinosaur youth was the 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 operating system that PCs ran on um and so the DOS box is basically an emulator that makes DOS open so it makes your computer open a program that thinks it's an old PC and you play the games through it so you can buy them now on on good old games and they tend to be very cheap like 2.99 or 3.99 and um, but all good old games does is it kind of does what what you could do yourself it download it it downloads with the game DOS box and the the file and and you basically a- emulate it but it's becoming a big a big thing now people are getting you know, really back into the old because they are like they really have something going for them. A lot of them, mm. a lot of stuff has been lost in in games. I think in the kind of AAA titles and yeah. Towards, yeah, yeah, realism and the perfect and Call of Duty. When Call, will we yeah, be ever to perfectly emulate the crazy fascist war? game where Yikes. you're like, you know, it's like this murder fest. It's like everybody's favorite game. It's so boring. Um, although I'm saying that after on a podcast where I'm talking about <laughs> Wolfenstein. Yeah, yeah um, uh, and I know I I accept the the, the contradictions. Um, uh, and it's funny, I, I, I want Sarah Marie to talk a bit more about the difference between first person and uh, and the, the way it makes you feel. Yeah. Because um, um, actually, first person, Wolfenstein is a kind of an anomaly for me because um, even though I, I'm and have been really into games and game culture, I, I'm not that good at, at playing games. Oh, so, I'm the same, yeah. so, um, same. I finished like two <laughs> games ever, I think. Probably yeah. my strength is in, in very slow games like role playing games mm. but the first person uh, game um Wolfenstein was perfect maybe because of the age I was and everything I did get good at it but but subsequent first person games that I tried later on in life um 
like Call of Duty, I just couldn't get the nuance or the, mm. or I couldn't be bothered. Yeah. Um. So so um. Actually, first person isn't my favorite. My favorite is is, and I I I'll have some more to say about it in a while. But the isometric view, where you're looking down on things from it from the top. Yeah. Like, yeah. From, yeah. 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 Totally. Um. But you talk. You please please share <laughs> about, about my yeah horrible car sickness. Yeah. Yeah. I get really very bad car sickness, and I've been playing games since I was very small. And I do like the isometric view as well in a big way because a lot of the games that the, that would have transported me hugely as a kid, like Link's Awakening, the, the Legend of Zelda game, and and, and like. Jesus, even Pokemon, things like that are all drop and it gives you a real sense of world and space mm. and your own place within that, mm. which I find really interesting. And again, when you're a kid, you want to be consumed by something. Mm-hmm. But for f- first persons, I-, I don't know what it does to my inner ear, but it makes me very sick. And um, <laughs> I had this experience playing Goldeneye on the Nintendo 64 with with a bunch of lads uh, as a as a, a wee sprite myself. I, I just have this this Ooh. idea of you going into the pharmacy now and saying, can I have um, travel sickness tablets? And they're like, like oh, C-bands. great, where are you going on holiday? No, I'm, I'm yeah. going home to play a computer yeah. game. But I will say, I recently, not recently, oh my God, it's not recently, but when I played, when I played Portal for the first time in 2010, Kerry, my, my husband, was like, you're going to love this. Mm. Um, I found the first person structure of that very comforting because it's quite fluid. It's mm. not jerky, and the world that you're in isn't very... When I was looking at Wolfstein earlier, I was like, God, those ceilings are very low. That's very claustrophobic. <laughs> and I immediately got this experience of claustrophobia from mm. it. Whereas Portal, even though it's an all, all an internal environment, as Shell, your your movement is very fluid and very mm. soft. And then in Portal 2, they somehow resign, uh, they somehow like refine that even further so that you just it just feels so organic, and it's really... It's non-jerky. It's, there's something about it that refreshes my sense of maybe claustrophobia that I have mm. gotten from first person mm. shooters mm. in the past and um, I think as well keeping you like an Annie Long car ride <laughs> when you want to throw up keeping yourself busy in those worlds like I can't just be moving forward and looking for things I have to be focused on achieving a puzzle and that's why Portal works for me because you have one set goal and every goal that you achieve teaches you something and it's mm. non it's, pa- it's pacifist mm-hmm. I guess <laughs> more yeah, or less much. Um, and the undoing of each puzzle teaches you something new in a really satisfying way. Mm. So it's not panicked. There's no fever behind it. It's just happening to you. So I think it's all, I think not only is it the the visual angles of the world, it's the charged atmosphere and the panic. So mm. where wherever the charged atmosphere, the, the, the clunky looking around and the claustrophobia intersect that's where I need to get up and leave the room because I'm feeling like I'm going to throw up and it's so strange but it really really happens yeah. so how did yeah. the, like, the boss fights in Portal like the very end the last bits Cause that's, in Portal? yeah that's I find fine when yeah. I played it I was like hey, I'm completely at sea here now I've oh, never played Portal, never <gasps> played Portal. Oh, oh you would Portal. love no. Portal I, I, I've, yeah I, and I, you know I, I, I've actually held it in my hand in the shop and said, okay, I'm going to buy this. And then I bought something else mm. instead. So, yeah. It's so, the writing is just the best writing. It's astonishing. Game. It's really, really yeah, I, then I'll yeah, say no more about actually, it because yeah. then it's best going blind. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Because it's a terrific experience. The writing is astonishing. The gameplay itself is so satisfying. Mm. And the mm. first person element of it mm. is, it adds to the experience of the game instead of, uh, alienating you or, or I don't know I'm, I'm, I may be the only person in the world who gets car sick from this but uh, <laughs> I think that's yeah. quite common actually I've heard other people say that before yeah. Yeah. it's one of those weird things yeah you don't see it in like gaming magazines so it's not written about in <laughs> games writing it's a personal essay yeah. about <laughs> the games that make yeah. me sick but I don't know yeah, yeah. sorry for the interruption um, it's me your old pal Alan did you know that the Heads of Podcast Network is a sponsor now well we do it's Bunsen and I want to tell you about the first time that I ate in Bunsen um, you might have noticed that the sound quality in this ad is different to the rest of the podcast, and that's because I'm not in a luxurious headstuff studio. I'm recording this on a dictaphone app on my phone in Waterford. Yep, I live in Waterford, and um, that will be important later, so remember it. Remember it very well. Um, so I was going to Dublin for a book launch, and I asked Twitter where I should eat beforehand. Uh, my friend Fiona said Bunsen, and because her food recommendations are always spot on, that's where I decided to go. Uh, I checked their website, bunsen.ie, uh, first, obviously, to check it out. And if you really want to get hungry for burgers, go look at bunsen.ie, because, my God, those burgers. So anyway, I arranged to meet my friend Trevor there. Um, I have a lot of friends, I'm not boasting, that's just how it is, you know. Um, but he's running late, um, so he set to order anyway without him. Um, so there I was, sitting in the Wexford Street Bunsen. Uh, just an old man, up from Waterford for the day, unaware of what was about to happen to his mouth. 
and the burger arrived and well go look at the website again it looked amazing as you all know uh, i bit into it and this genuinely happened uh, i said holy shit out loud by myself in bunsen uh, bunsen burgers are so good god if i lived in dublin i'd eat there all the time rotating between the three locations of extra street temple bar and Ann street so that the staff didn't try to stage an intervention on me but i live in waterford so that's not going to happen anytime soon so please eat a bunsen burger today for all us poor non-dubliners who can't so yeah so yeah, i was going to talk about then um the isometric yeah, oh, yeah the, the lockdown yeah. yeah yeah um it, 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 so it's at a kind of a three-quarter angle so you're not you're not looking directly down from mm. from from above there were games where you, there, there was a, different games where you could look directly down as if you were um bird's eye. a ceiling yeah like mm. a bird's eye like as if you're a tile in the ceiling or something um but the isometric view is you, you're at an angle so you can see kind of three-dimensional structures mm. and um stuff like that um there was there, there was something about that particular angle that even if a game was absolutely crap um for a while um if i could see little figures moving around on this three-dimensional uh, plane that i could control or move around mm-hmm. that it, it, even if the gameplay was rubbish that there was still some kind of a magic or something about it uh, and i've thought a good bit about it since because it, it, obviously anything that that affects you and uh it, because we're all we're all there's always going to be other people like you um i've noticed that there's there's a, a, a revival in in three or, or the isometric role playing games by people who've said oh role playing games went absolutely rubbish after they switched to the first person from from the isometric view mm. so the last great uh, there are games you might have heard of um uh, isometric PC role playing games were probably Fallout 2 mm. and um B- Baldur's Gate and and Baldur's yeah. Gate 2 and Neverwinter yeah. Nights and I suppose they're kind of the peak of it for me and and I played them even quite quite late on when my imagination was quite dried up and jaded <laughs> and and still they still kind of affected me as as profoundly so I've thought a lot about like wh- wh- what is, what is it about that viewpoint and then I have one worrying idea that maybe it's it's because I, I'm quite um, deferent in real life and and passive. Uh, maybe it's something megalomaniac because you feel like a god. <laughs> yeah, because, because this is the angle. Yeah, because yeah, you're a god looking at it, its world with like its little figures, and you know. Um, the other thing is is like then I thought, well, it's a bit like chess or or a board game, um, yeah. but in real life, and and it's not just again, it's not just. The, the strategizing or the, the, like chess is aesthetically pleasing because the figures are nicely carved and the the there's a kind of um geometric symmetry to the board um and the two players are kind of like gods as well mm. so there's that as well moving their little uh, armies around but but there, there there is like i think something that's often overlooked is is aesthetics and not in just normally like game reviews can and were frustrating in that when they talk about the graphics um mm-hmm. they're just talking but but there has been a change since but but normally they're just talking about how realistic is it you yeah. know how close to real life not quite some reviewers would be more clued in but 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 it would tend more to be about how how realistic and and um flashy it looked as opposed to how refined mm. it looked and i think it, it it definitely the aesthetic of the game is a big a big part of the experience and that games that look look you know aesthetically pleasing have have definitely appealed to me more over the years than ones that don't. yeah that's why Dial. so many first person shooters are just oh, yeah. blah it's just yeah. brown and grey everything and it's, unca- yeah. it's uncanny valley as well like I played a, a like Noir uncanny valley Gary yeah and yeah. we were all just like they're, they look like it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck but it's not breathing mm. and I that it falls into that <laughs> weird liminal <laughs> yeah. space where you're like you're yeah. testing they couldn't have just put in a chest animation but some like, of those <laughs> games have a really cool uncanny oh. appeal at the same time yeah. <laughs> I was playing there's this game that came out it, it, you know Skyrim the yeah, role player yeah, yeah. Um, but the game that, that preceded it or no no 
bar one, the, the Oblivion preceded it, but the one that came before that was called Morrowind. Uh, and I downloaded that off Steam again, to, just to play it again, because I remember when I played it the first time, I thought, whoa, the the characters in it are really realistic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but then it's just like, now you play it, they're like mannequins out of Brown Thomas <laughs> with, like, <laughs> with like, you know... Um, the, their entire face is static and their mouth is just like kind of wriggling as they, as they speak and yeah. they're, they're, but but there's something um kind of darkly weird and and cool about it now like in in retrospect and and makes it makes you think as well about like um the levels of realism in games what we think right now is like super real we'll probably look back in two years it's amazing how, oh, yeah. how uh, it mutable dated. it is yeah, whereas, how... with, whereas games that are deliberately designed and stylized age better mm. like I remember when um, oh for sure like when I remember I remember when I bought the Wind Waker for the GameCube when I was growing up big Zelda kit all the way up and there was this huge backlash against it because it was cell shaded so it was very very stylized everything and it looked sort of slightly cartoonish and there were no defined lines on any of the figures everything mm. moved in a really interesting way this it is was, a Zelda game yeah, yeah and yeah. it's beautiful it's set on the open sea it's a very beautiful game it's it, on the DS the Nintendo uh, hand no it's on the Wii U at the oh, moment the they, they did okay. a HD version Brilliant. of it which is delicious yeah. because it was deliberately stylized it wasn't like let's try and make this mm. main character look like a real person let's try and it was more like let's try and do an artistic interpretation mm. of it and that game is is oh Jesus is 15 years old something like that something <laughs> this, is the, this is the horror of talking yeah. something that would shock you to your core as you probably are learning as you go through these podcasts yeah, it's throwback juvenilia yeah. it's, it's like it yeah. should be called how ancient are you <laughs> the, po- the podcast <laughs> uncomfortable yeah. home truth bleeding somehow. ancient yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. But like it still looks great. It holds up because the design was deliberate and it was an it was an artistic movement mm. instead of an attempt to emulate reality in some way, mm. which becomes uncanny and looks shitty because it's it's like a, a rung and a ladder of them trying to get this thing perfect as opposed to hey, this is a pretty picture we drew, yeah. which stays pretty even if it's fifteen years old or mm. twenty years old. I'm thinking like that runs your braid. Mm. Like oh, Braid is outstanding! It, like, yeah. You look at you know instantly that it's Braid when you see it. Yeah, every single shot of it, every yeah. single screen is that's d- undeniably it's Braid. Itself. Yeah, but it also yeah. couldn't have existed with Braid. Couldn't specifically have existed without its predecessors. Oh yeah, and I love that the games that we get to play now that would be the sort of the indie guys, the indie development g- de- yeah. developed games. Are there written. are some really cool mind-bending ideas yeah. coming out yeah. in some of the indie games. Another one that I remember um, was Fez. That I was, love oh, yeah, Fez. That was, was yeah. stunning. You know, yeah. Carrie couldn't play Fez. My husband couldn't play Fez at all. And I sat down and I don't know what happened, but I was like, this is the game that I've mm-hmm. been waiting to play yeah. my whole yeah. life. I know exactly how to play this. And mm-hmm. he was kind of yeah. sitting there and was like, that's amazing. I was like, I don't know what's happening to me <laughs> because I've been jumping over holes my whole life mm-hmm. because that's what I t- learned how to do when I was a tiny kid. And the use of dimensional space in Fez is amazing amazing as well like it just goes on in this the world is is this incredible like tree of space and uh listener <laughs> go play it it's stunning uh oh fez is great fez yeah. is available on steam for yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but you yeah, know but but equally fez and braid and even undertale we mentioned earlier couldn't exist without the mm. games that came before them so we're we have the luxury even within the sort of clunkiness of steam to be able to play games that are developed by people who were who played like Wolfenstein when they were growing up? Who played the games we played? Yeah, you yeah. know, it's like a, a touchstone. So you said you kind of got out of games once you discovered music and stuff, did you? Yeah, yeah. like um, um, not well. I never really got totally out of them, but but um, like looking back, and I probably look back a little more than than is healthy, but because because I write and yeah. and mm. I think a bit about you know. Um, periods that I passed through in my life and uh, the ins and outs of them but uh, f- for yeah f- for for a while I think the predominant I suppose like I wasn't in sports and stuff so most of my hobbies and stuff would have been kind of based around my imagination mm. so so first it, it was books then it was games um even though I continued to read but games became the you know the the hu- the, the, the the kind of the, the lord of my imagination, yeah. mm. um, but then it became books again, uh, horror, horror um, fiction around the age of fifteen and sixteen, fourteen, fifteen. But 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 then f- from that period onwards, um, right through my twenties, I was completely obsessed with music, um, mm. uh, in indie music, um, and then subsequently techno, which <laughs> which I'm still 
very like I'm still it's very very but but after that then it was po- poetry um, mm. and games again yeah. then after that so I suppose everyone goes through fa- phases in their lives yeah um, as they grow older but but like yeah a lot of people kind of come back to games later they like do I think, think so yeah once that you get that distance between the ones you grew up with and you're kind of taking yeah. back on them you kind of and want I to think there's them. questions to be asked about the stigma <laughs> of being being yeah. a person an adult who plays games because Real talk yes. yeah because if you say to someone when you're in your 30s as I am that that um, well for a start the word gamer has and probably not undeservedly so because of the behaviour of, of different mm. people on the yeah. internet um, mm. the word gamer carries with it a whole weight of associations um, um, that it's it's sometimes in a lot of people's eyes if you say you play computer games yeah. in your 30s they think you're some kind of a you know a baby baby brain or mm. you know a, you've, yeah, yeah you've arrested development mm. and um yeah, you live in your parents' <laughs> basement <laughs> and, you know, you have bad personal hygiene and stuff like yeah. this um, and kind of unreconstructed, you know, views on, on various yeah. issues and stuff like that. I think like people, that. Prob- people probably think of, like, FIFA and Call of Duty straight away, you think, say about that as well, because Ye- there's so much more to games now y- yeah, than there was. Yeah, definitely, yeah. So it's like someone who plays, like, Nico Atsume or Candy Crush all day, like my wife does. Yeah. She's a gamer much more than I am, but she, just doesn't re- she wouldn't realise it. Yeah. you know like yeah, everybody is kind of is now yeah well my fiance she, she's like like I said I it's funny um, I'm like probably really really into game culture but, mm-hmm. but not great at playing them yeah but she's not so much into game culture but she's she, she's actually so so much better than me at playing them she mm-hmm. downloads um, these strategy games and I I, I just kind of look over her shoulder and see she's just trouncing people left <laughs> right and center like these clash of clan games and stuff. oh yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, um she immediately just sort of powers up and beats all the, the novices and she's on to the next level and mm. she just she's just it's and then i think maybe i'm stupid <laughs> <laughs> i can't do strategy yeah. games even like command and conquer and stuff back in the day i just and like yeah. Everybody was obsessed with Red Alert. Remember in school, you just yeah. Make me very panicked. I feel like yeah, it takes them the all too much to hide. Yeah. There's it's a lot like... of micromanagement, and yeah. and it's funny because in her in her job, she's she you know there's I see it in that analogous. She's quite she's quite good at strategizing and managing. Mm. So so, it, um, but I would not dare play because I w- I would be have my ass handed to me <laughs> even like in probably in any game. I yeah. think she would learn it so quickly. Yeah. Really, I mean, carrying yeah. a wicked competitive show. Alan was with us, Alan Karsh, in our house last night before yeah. we came out to record, and we cracked up Mario Kart. And <laughs> me and Kerry oh, cool. were kind of getting fairly you serious were about it. Each it was other. Just yeah, like it we was were really, <laughs> it was pretty, pretty intense. When we were in living in America, and we got Mario Kart Eight. We played it nearly every night because it was just like crack the knuckles, get out the frustrations of the day, let's go. And it, you know, doesn't doesn't quite descend into name calling, mm. but um, yeah. but it gets pretty. Subtext, just like, the subtext is there. Do you yeah. hate that? <laughs> do you hate? Do you hate that shell that I just hit you with? Do you yeah. hate that? Like, it's pretty, it's pretty funny but uh good yeah. old mario kart oh yeah. man it's just the most it's it's been a miracle since day one frankly and it's yeah. only gotten better but uh the yeah there's your it's, it is a funny thing about the stigma because i love talking about video games i love listening i read about video games all the time i watch youtube video games of mm. other people playing video games all the time but when i meet somebody in the wild who is like oh i'm a gamer i'm like immediately going Oh God! Do you hate me? Do you, <laughs> are you gonna? Are you one of these people who says horrible things to me on the internet? Mm. Or ah, who are? Are you a good guy? Are you a bad guy? Ah, should I? Yeah, should I jump not, on your head? I don't know. Yeah, so it, sure it, it and it's nerve wracking. And I don't yeah. meet many other women who. I've worked in GameStop for two and a half years, and I met the odd other woman who worked in who loved video games through that. But by and large, it was just this ocean of, of bros, mm. and or early sort of prototype bros because it was ten years ago, and. Um, before we had a word for it. <laughs> and um, I'm sure there were words for it back then, but before it was an easy social sort of button to press. And uh, I was taught to be embarrassed of the fact that I played video games because mm. I was a girl, because automatically there was quizzing and there was, now nah, you're not really a gamer and oh, you're just doing it for attention. And I'm kind of sitting there going, I don't think I would have gotten these tattoos if I was just <laughs> doing it for it. I don't think mm. I got a Super Nintendo from when I was six. Like I played a lot of this by myself for many years before I learned to talk to anybody about it and like I was saying earlier it's hardly brunch conversation with other with other mm. ladies and things mm. like that it's a funny thing to to carry so much love for and um, to exist with in almost isolation that mm. it's like I don't play a lot of multiplayer games other than Mario Kart um, but by and large it's sort of this solo quest that you go on by yourself and uh 
it's a real delight to actually get to hear other people talk about it and to speak to them about it, but not feel like you have to have an argument. Mm. Yeah. You know, that it's a, ben- a benign, cheerful conversation you can have with other people about video games that doesn't end in, like... Women's rights, ah, more, more. you know, which I'm all about, and I'm always ready to do. Like I'm, yeah. I'm two seconds off it at any point. But it's re- oh, it's refreshing to talk to people about it, and not have to, not have to sort of defend myself. I guess mm. you know, it's a strange thing. Yeah. So you mentioned mul- multiplayer multiplayer games. Mm. That's another one. I I I'm ter- I've never played a multiplayer game, um, and it's kind of it's kind of one of the the, the great new well in terms of the entire history of games um it's it became it's a modern phenomenon b- a big thing yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. um they always just absolutely terrified me and i think it's something to do with my uh, my introvert my introversion that i i'm uh, when i'm playing a game um i i don't want the unpredictability or the, yeah. the mm. um you can learn a game yeah learn that, or, that, game. Yes. or even yeah mm. or, or even just like like the idea of another human frightens me. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what it is, but like I watch my friends playing multiplayer games, and they're like barking into the into their headsets, you know, <gasps> at at people, and they're you know they're like um, I have a friend who who um, plays plays um, Call of Call of Duty. Mm. Well, used to play it on the Xbox 360s, and his he he was in his like early 30s, and he would be shouting at these like 15 year old kids over <laughs> yeah. in America, telling them what to do, or they would be telling him to to get screwed, and he'd be saying, "Yeah, go up yourself," and all this, and I, I it just to me it just seems like this crazy Irish. wild yeah. Yeah. chaos that I don't I I want to I just want to be in this. Um, magical universe where I'm yeah. the only hum- human. <laughs> exactly. When, I, when I'm playing a game, yeah. Like with the team ones, especially, like we used to go play the Miniature Cafe in Cork and play Battlefield when we were in college. And you feel like you're letting people down. You know, yeah. them, it? yeah, all so the, the pressure. All the, like, all I'm, the I'm things sorry. that you want to escape I'm so from sorry in real life yeah. when you're playing a game, yeah. suddenly yeah. you're back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> crushing weight of other people's expectations. And and, yeah. and and you know there are cases where 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 documented cases where multiplayer games have led to real life violence and mm. indeed mur- up to including murder. Like um, Eve Online is just Eve Online is nuts. the big. I can one. read about Eve yeah. without ever playing it. So, I never so played it, but Eve I can read on, about it. Eve Online, uh, maybe for the podcast listeners. Yeah, because this podcast is probably. I'm so excited. <laughs> podcast is probably quite ar- arcane now yeah, at this stage. That's what we want, though. Yeah. Um, It'll find its dear love. I feel like there's, there's a bunch of people out there who've been waiting for this. Yeah. You know, Eve, Eve Online is a space management si- and and combat simulator game where where there's like um, hundreds of thousands of people who are flying spaceships from the very tiniest little spaceships to these gigantic behemoth spaceships. Um, that are, that they trade. It's kind of like a capitalism simulator. What is that? People form yeah, corporations. So, so they stuff. form yeah, these yeah. corporations. They form these alliances, um, and they either go into battle or they they go into treaties. They they discover goods and they they exchange them for prices, and then they plot like wars and they mm. plot, um, and it all takes place in this this, you know. It, universe it's space you know yeah. so so it um um the vastness of it can't be um overstated but the biggest ships you can get in eve can be bought with a mixture of the online currency and real life mm. currency because there is a secondary kind of it kind of in in all these games and they try they always try and weed it out but it never, they never can fully weed it out there's mm. sort of behind the scenes uh black market going on ah, where people yeah. are buying buying uh people who have more money to spend can buy more power for themselves within yeah. the game um but the biggest ships in it um can have a real world value of 4 or 5000 quid <laughs> and um I think it was in Korea. Some guy lost a weapon or or a or a ship or something in Eve, and the person who it, the person who it happened to was so aggrieved, he kind of did a, a, a doxing or an IP hunt on the person. Now this could be like this could be me completely get missing this, but there is a story that's like this, yeah. and this is I think I think this is accurately what happened. He he. Um, uh, Found the guy and mur- murdered him <laughs> in real life. Yeah, Jeez. so so yeah, that's that's the kind of. 
probably a good morality tale that that backs up my uh, mm. um, distrust and fear and of multiplayer, multiplayer games. Yeah. My favorite Eve story <laughs> is that there was like you know there are corporations they have like CEOs and financial officers and you have to basically join one of these corporations or they will just crush you. And it's like real life. <laughs> yeah, but something awful have their own corporation. Oh my god! And they managed to turn to, like the treasury officer of the biggest corporation, and he gave all their info to them. And they destroyed like three hundred thousand dollars worth of their ships, oh my God. like a real world money. And there's like things of like people going to people's houses and cutting their power it's at like vital a moments kind of a and stuff. It's a capitalist nightmare. It really it, is. It's it completely makes you unfettered. Of the modern like, world. Yeah, and it makes you you wish that like. Um, Roland Barthes or, or Theodore Adorno or someone was around <laughs> oh to write the, the you know, to write the, the big essay on, on what's so uh, troubling and weird mm. about about this game and, and um to kind of cast a kind of an eye over it. I think it's there's a lot of fascinating things to be said mm. about modern the modern world in yeah. in, in microcosm and in, in that terms game. of like people like Roland Barthes, I feel like those theorists are beginning to bloom, but unfortunately anytime anybody writes anything interesting or critical or attempts to elate gaming in the get gaming in like the critical gaze to something that is looked upon like cinema, then a gamer has just come for them. Mm, I feel like yeah. anytime v- gaming is treated with the same integrity as cinema, especially through th- any any sort of critical theory lens, uh, let alone feminism, mm. people just come for them, mm. and they are literally chased off. I mean, I, they are doxxed, they are uh, mm. they are swatted. They they call the cops and send fraught SWAT teams ter- to it home. It is fraught territory. It's mm. it's yeah. It's, it's defended so ardently. Yeah. That like, God, I would lo- I would love to write about gaming, but my God, it's not worth it. Yeah. Mm. It's not worth it for me, and that is the that's a heartbreaker. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting kind of psych like you could do kind of armchair psychology, and it's tempting to, but 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 um, it reminds me a lot of of people who I knew that were into heavy metal um, Mm. um, kind of in group out group ideas that 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 they codify their you know who and what they are um, and be distrust because possibly like people now this is me being an armchair psychologist and hey, possibly possibly entirely wrong but um maybe people who who earlier in their lives might have been mistreated or felt rejected mm. um and that when they form their own groups um i think the 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 codifications become quite strong and the you know the the sort of rules and and the, the the sense of the group becomes maybe not in a good way um Charged. Uh, yeah and mm. and there's kind of gatekeeping and um anger and grievance and hurt you know mm. um um and, and it's no coincidence that, that a lot of them are, are, are probably men who 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 are maybe lonely or or you know have mm. have had difficulties maybe been bullied that kind of stuff you get a sense of it um um and now i'm painting a very broad brush strokes here which is something i don't like to do and i don't like to be teleological so i i, I i'm saying all that with a kind of a uh, Approximation, quali- qualification, yeah, yeah. That I'm not, I'm not speaking in absolutes here. Mm. It's just a floating, a, 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 an idea, you know. Mm. But, but it's real, and it's it's something that I. That's that's why I I I feel like I, I love games from a, from a distance, from a non <laughs> a non presence. Like I would love to tweet about them more. I would love to talk about them more. But I maybe that world isn't for me. Maybe the mm. games are for me, but maybe mm. the world of it isn't for me. And that's a bummer. Mm. But okay, yeah, because that means I still get to go and enjoy the games. Yeah, I still get to go and play. It's about play, and you know. I've noticed this thing as well. Um, I don't pay close that close in attention because because I've never really identified. It's funny for all my interest in games, it's probably because I'm not that good at them. I've never really identified as a gamer, mm. Mm. so I only pay kind of passing attention to all the politics and the Gamergate thing and all that that happened oh, we've said it now. <laughs> don't put that in the episode <laughs> <Yeah>. description <laughs> um, <laughs> don't want them to find us uh, that, but but like 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 I've seen some truly repugnant stuff being kind of um, alluded to online and it, the, the most the most interesting thing is is this idea that that if um, a woman games journalist or a woman um, is employed kind of in a visible way by a games corporation there's this immediate sort of witch hunt to find out is she an authentic gamer Mm. or not or is she just a pretend nerd and this goes into the broader aspects of of so-called nerd culture um where you will have people saying no she's pretending to be a nerd for attention 
um, and pretending to be a nerd to earn money. Um, but it's always a female, and it's, oh yeah, it's it's so it's it's yeah, it's fascinating in its repugnance and um, uh, something yeah, something that that definitely is out there and and um, probably part of the reason why we mentioned the stig the stigma why, why there is there might mm. be you know there might be good reason for for elements of of the the stigma um but it's a shame it's a shame that mm. that games um i think but at the same time i uh, i would say that you know like any new art form is always sort of kind of rubbished and distrusted at the beginning like you mm. think of mm. surrealism and art and dadaism and the entire history of art and poetry the, the you know the experimental stuff is always kind of by the people who who are afraid of it or don't want to engage with it it's very easy to call it out as spoofery or rubbish or mm. whatever um and then it, you know it's only later but slowly you know the quality is 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 you know, hopefully finds its way and, and, and enters. Now, I don't like the idea of canon, but enters into a, you know, a, 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 canon a, rec- of yeah, a recollected, yeah. you know, um, memory of what's good. Mm. Um, uh, recollected memory of what's <laughs> good. That's, an, that's yeah. amazing. Um, I love that. Um, but, but like, I think games are, it, it is going that way. Like the artistry definitely, and especially in Japan of, of stuff like the Mega Man games were kind of the peak of the 8-bit, I think, and, and Mario. Um, uh, you know, th- a lot of this stuff I think is is being recognized as the art it is. And mm. art is a, is a, is a word but that gets Mario's thrown around. But 25 years yeah. old. Yeah. It's so yeah. young. It's and come so far. Like and it is, films it is, up to I, this stuff is art, yet. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and do, when you do oh. think like, you know, like the, the, there are poets, um, uh, you know, that, that that have fallen out of favor for, for 100 or 150 years after mm-hmm. they, they wrote their poems. That's how long it takes people to, to get back into them and, and say, oh, OK, you know, this, this, you know, and, and in art, there are very glaring <laughs> examples like, you know, Vincent van Gogh. Mm. And, um, you know, he it was two or three years after it was, you know, he, the first positive review of his paintings was was within months of him dying by mm. a French critic, and and it was still a good bit after that before um, there was a general, or not even general, like, just among enough people to to, to get people noticing him. Mm. It was it was it took a few a good few yeah. years, um, and it can take longer, you know, like in po- poetry there have been poets that uh, it has been a hundred mm. years or more. Or, you know, two hundred. With, with games, I think maybe with like maybe pop culture in general, there's the instant reaction now, so things don't even get that chance. Yeah, you know, they're just gone if they're not. Instantly yeah, things liked. are judged in a minute, yeah. and it's funny, uh, and uh, and it happens with TV as well. Mm. Like I, I, I often um, read with with complete um, disbelief or or, or, or skepticism these. Um, you know, reviews of of a TV show the day after it came on or its yeah. first episode. Yeah. How, like, how can they know? Um, mm. Like, like something a, a good TV show is is it has to play out its story over twelve episodes. I don't yeah. know how someone can say after episode one, "This is a turkey," mm. which they do. And I know it's the nature of of uh, yeah, yeah, and click yeah. clicks and money and and the whole thing. But um, um, yeah, it really bugged me about like like. Uh, Something that I think will be on TV just to, 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 to step into a different art form um, that came on recently that, that was rubbish all over America. Um, they were talking about it in terms of this is the greatest turkey ever. And it was the second season of True Detective. I okay. think that'll be I think people will look back and say, no, actually, that that was the the. TV show that kind of defined its moment, and I think I think a lot of it was people were allergic to it or couldn't make head or tail out of its its weird critique of of capitalist America um, and um, what's kind of going on in America right now at the moment, as opposed to the idealized version that you get in other TV shows mm. that might be more comforting um, because it presents a sort of a nightmare version of America. Um, but I, I just couldn't get over the absolute, like, like they were just they. Uh, it was across yeah. the board. It was pan. I think a lot of people were maybe embarrassed by how much they liked season one up until the ending. Yeah, and then they kind of went, oh, that 
they they were a little bit embarrassed by how much they got over season one. Yeah, so I had to pull it back. Actually, I didn't watch all season two of it. I kind yeah. of got a bit bored, but I'm going to go back it to it is now. Weird. I'm going to pull it out the is. unpopular yeah. opinion. Claxon hated it. Hated yeah. season one so mad. I'm like, why are all the women in this? Mothers are strippers. <laughs> why? What a masculinity crisis? I was just like, oh, look at all my nopes. You know, <laughs> and you know, but but I think even even I think the director in season two, there, I think there is an under um, tow that addresses um there's there's a very i think there's a very sophisticated and nuanced um uh, narrative about about female sexuality okay. and i think it's a complete response actually um and almost a sort of uh, holding its hands up to the first uh, one. um you know or or saying you know look you know this mm. is but but again like like it's a it's weird, and I could be wrong. And I um, like the I did. Um, I did enjoy the weird touches. The, I was excited for the weirdness. Yeah, but then it it just it, was it, everything about it. Though it has this weird kind of peculiar gold color, that, and and it, it cuts to these shots of the the L A freeway at night, um, and they're truly uncanny. And it's really like it really got under my skin. And mm. I think that would be as good, a, uh, I suppose, as good a reason to say something is is good. Um, if it affects you in that way, you know, if yeah. it makes the hairs on your neck stand up, or you know, if it has a kind of a peculiar. Yeah, I don't think I don't pull. need things like hold together in every single way and be perfect. If there's yeah. always to leave something, yeah, which you like, just some kind of images in your head when you think of it. Like yeah, it's worked yeah. well. Well, True yeah. Detective Two is full of weird. Yeah, it starts with like, like I liked it from the very first. It it, it starts with like this blood sky over over these mountains in in L.A. and it's called the um, Western Book of the Dead, um, which is a play on the Tibetan. The first episode was called the Western Book of the Be- Dead, which is a play on uh, obviously on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. But I think as well, it's a play on um, a book by Cormac McCarthy called Blood Meridian. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it's saying that Blood Meridian is the Western Book of the Dead. And Blood Meridian uh, identifies America as a country born out of genocide and violence that never quite came to terms with it, that mm. the continuum wasn't broken. And it seems to be saying, because the, see, Blood Meridian has um, a parenthesis underneath the title. It's like Moby Dick. It's called Moby Dick or the Whale, but Blood Meridian is Blood Meridian or the the evening redness in the West. So, so it seems to be a kind of a, you know, saying the Blood Meridian America is what's caused the Nightmare America that's in True Detective season mm. two. But that could be a whole other podcast. <laughs> 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 a whole other podcast, yeah. Let's be back. Let's bring it back to Wolfenstein briefly yeah. for a finish. Um, I can do. Yeah. I can do um, impersonations of some of the sound effects. Let's do that. Well, no. Yeah. Well, for, first is, is well, they're not good. <laughs> <laughs> but but I realise that they're. You know, you've got a kind of a lizard brain where like oh yeah, things yeah. that the things that you saw when you were a child that you didn't realise they're still mm. all in there. And yeah. I was really good at playing it as well. Actually, I could. I I knew where all the guards were and stuff. But but just before they, they say that the the um the German in the game they speak in little sound bites of German the baddies and that that it was completely ungrammatical because the guys had a had a a bad German translation program or something. <laughs> um so the German is all grammatically faulty and everything. But the first scar goes <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then the, like you know the way it, like the, something I always thought was really stupid in Wolfenstein is, is is that you can collect treasure as well as kill things. Yeah. Um but there seems to be no point to collecting the treasure. You don't win any prizes for mm-hmm. it. You, you have a score but the score seems completely redundant. Um, but it goes <laughs> <laughs> and then there's dogs I can't do the dogs but they bark and um, it, like a lot of it is so peculiar it's almost camp uh, you can eat the dog food or it, for, for energy and the other thing you can eat is like this, these lovely chicken roast dinners <laughs> oh just like, like sitting randomly all over the, the castle that's the like ground. the full turkeys you find in bins and yeah, rage. Yeah, yeah 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 so um, yeah it's um it's it's uh, what we would say it's seminal it's a game that has mm. completely um probably created a genre and jo- like like aspects that were innovated in the game are still being replicated in games 25 years later which is absolutely mind blowing mm. so um yeah a good game there we go all right thank you so much Darren Paul and Sarah Griffin <laughs> thanks everybody <laughs> bye bye, bye. And that's it. Um, thank you again so much to Darren McCausland and Sarah Marie Griffin. 
Um, like I said, originally Dara's work can be read in Stonecutter, Gorse and Dublin Review and Sarah Marie Griffin's book, Spare and Found Parts, is out in October. Um, please uh, support Headstuff's Patreon at patreon.com I'm not sure for slash headstuff um, you get cool things and it helps support this website and keeps the podcast going um, subscribe and rate and review us on iTunes because that's really important because it gets it up into the charts and such which I love because I'm an egomaniac and what else listen to other things on the Headstuff Podcast Network because they're all really good for instance Alice's little show Fast Day with Goro Farley No On Corp to Hanratty and the original Headstuff podcast. This is a... That was a, quite a DJ voice, wasn't it? It wasn't. It sounded terrible, but I, in my head it's a DJ voice. Like, uh, hey. Anyway, thank you. Goodbye. See you next time. Goodbye. This has been a production of the Headstuff Podcast Network.